a sudden she's making a speech and saying there will be no tax on tips. I said that months ago. I happen to be the first union member on a presidential ticket since Ronald Reagan. But rest assured, I won't lose my way. Our focus is on de-escalating tensions, uh, working on enabling that ceasefire and, and getting these hostages returned home. Good to be with you. I'm Robert Costa in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. For the first time, Governor Tim Wall solo on the campaign trail. He addressed union members in Los Angeles this afternoon. This comes as the Democratic ticket is working to solidify support with organized labor. And while former President Donald Trump is making headlines for his return to X last night, following some technical difficulties on that platform, the former president has been discussing his recent assassination attempt, and he has also shared plans for mass deportations next year with billionaire Elon Musk. Caitlin Huey Burns and Weijia Jang join us now. Great to have both of you here. Let's begin with Caitlin here at the table. I want to play former President Trump on that X platform last night with Elon Musk. Let's listen. But these yeah. are tough people at the top of their game. And when they see a Kamala or when they see uh, a Biden, Sleepy Joe, they can't even believe yeah. it. They can't believe this happened. Caitlin, you're heading to Asheville, North Carolina, to cover former President Trump this week. Mm -hmm. What are you hearing from Trump's sources about how he's calibrating or recalibrating his campaign as he faces down Vice President Harris? Well, it's interesting, Bob, because last week I asked former President Trump how he's recalibrating his campaign to compete against Harris, and he said he's not changing anything. The campaign believes that they can transfer Biden's record onto Harris, but they also acknowledge that their polling shows what public polling has been showing, which is that Harris has been successful in not only consolidating the Democratic base, but energizing them as well. She's made significant gains among black voters, particularly older black men. Uh, and so she has tightened this race and changed the game. And you heard in that interview, two hours long on that platform X, the former president wants to criticize Harris and her record. The campaign wants to make this about her. Uh, but he has trouble staying on message and going after her on specific items. Uh, what we heard in that speech last night or in that um, uh, interview last night was akin to the speeches that he's given at rallies. Uh, so his campaign wants him to focus on the economy, the border, Harris's record. They're calling this the Harris administration. But he has interviews like this where he goes on all sorts of tangents. Whether that appeals to those small, uh, that small sliver of voters in the middle, that remains to be seen. And Weija, good, good to have you with us here on America Decides. President Biden's been back, not just, uh, uh, well, he's been back at the White House after being at Rehoboth Beach. Uh, now he's on the road talking about the Biden moonshot on cancer. Let's, let's hear what the president had to say today. It's critically important. I started this back in the administration with President uh, at, at the time, when I was vice president, and we found out that I traveled a every major cancer research facility in the world. Weijia, it's an interesting moment for President Biden. He's going to speak at the Democratic National Convention, likely on Monday evening. And he is now going back to one of these core issues that he has, has animated his political life, not just at, during his presidency, but the vice presidency with President Obama. What are you hearing uh, from the Biden people about how he's going to be making some policy emphasis uh, on the road in the coming weeks ahead of the election and what he's going to do at the convention. Robert, it's always great to see you both. And you're absolutely right. This is a shortened amount of time for the president to try to solidify his legacy. And we know how much the cancer moonshot program means to him because, of course, he was inspired by the death of his son, Bo Biden, who died at the age of 46 from cancer. And so this issue is near and dear to his heart, which makes total sense why it is his first event official event, I should say, since he announced his decision to uh, leave the top of the Democratic ticket. And so he wanted to discuss all of the uh, financial uh, gains that this project has made, $150 million in new research for eight organizations, including Tulane University, uh, where he delivered this address. And I think you hit something really important, Bob, which is that, you know, he recognizes that there is now a limited amount of time to make sure that these key pieces of his legacy re really remain in the spotlight. So I expect that every chance he gets, including when he delivers a keynote speak 
speech at the uh, DNC convention on Monday, he will be taking a walk down memory lane to remind people of all that he has accomplished and his administration has accomplished over the course of three and a half years. And I always say that one thing Biden never had on his side, Robert, was time, because a lot of these huge proposals that were signed into law are going to take time for Americans to feel. So I do think that in decades, uh, you know, his legacy will be remembered even more. And so because he has to, to remind people in this moment, I think you'll be hearing a lot about uh, what he feels proudest of that he's done here at the White House. And the campaign continues. Uh, you think about campaign history, Caitlin. I think about 1992, uh, George H.W. Bush, then president, uh, went to a grocery store, and everyone wonders, can a president connect with everyday people? And Bill Clinton famously ran yeah. against Bush, saying he doesn't really get it. I feel your pain. Clinton ends up winning the White House in a tight election in 92. Now you have Governor Tim Walz on the campaign trail, mm -hmm. really framing this uh, as a Democratic populist argument against Trump, yeah. saying he can't feel our pain, he doesn't get it. Let's listen mm -hmm. to what Governor Walz had to say about former President Donald Trump. I keep asking this to make a contrast here. Can you simply picture Donald Trump working at a McDonald's trying to make a McFlurry or something? It's, oh, he knows, he knows us, he knows us. He couldn't run that damn flurry, McFlurry machine if it tells him anything. Populism versus populism. Trump yeah. has cast himself as the champion of working people on the conservative mm -hmm. side. Governor Tim Walz is saying, don't buy that argument. Stay with yeah. the Democrats. The working voter is such a central issue in this election. What do you make of Governor Walls and his argument? Yeah, Bob, and you're exactly right. And we've talked about this before, about how working voters, especially union members, are kind of the prized voters of this election cycle for both campaigns. I mean, at the RNC that you and I were both at, the president of the Teamsters spoke. Um, you see Walls today speaking to a the, one of the largest public sector unions and trying to identify with them as a former public school teacher and a former member of, of the teachers union there. Uh, what is interesting, though, when you think about the economic pitches that the campaign is making, the Trump campaign believes that voters, while the economy may look like it's improving on paper, voters are not feeling it. And so they're not going to speak positively about the economy. And their kind of overall message is uh, one of, you know, prices are too high. People just can't afford basic things anymore, and they can't have the freedoms to, to do that. Uh, and they're also going to try to hammer Harris for Biden administration uh, ideas and uh, policies. So the question is, can Harris separate herself from Biden when it comes to this? You know, she's kind of campaigning as a new candidate here. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of the, the big target of the Trump campaign. And Ouija, quickly, what's on the agenda for President Biden the rest of this week? Well, he and uh, Vice President Harris are actually going to appear together later this week at an event to talk about lowering costs for Americans. Of course, that's pretty broad, but they are expected to announce some new ideas together. Even though it is an official White House event, it will be held in Maryland. Of course, you know very well, Bob, that even if it is official in this capacity from now until November, there's only a short amount of time. So every appearance, every speech is truly a campaign event as well, even if it's not marked as that. And so uh, as you uh, discussed with the president, he will officially be campaigning for uh, the vice president coming up, although we don't have dates yet. We expect him to go to all the battleground states uh, to really try to bolster support of her and maintain this enthusiasm. Robert. Ouija, your comrades are going to fluster all, all of those Hatch Act watchdogs out there. I don't know. Maybe everything's the campaign. I said, officially, it's officially a White House event. But, right. I like you, you, know. you, you tell the truth. You call it as you see it. Caitlin Huey Burns and Ouija Jang, thank you. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says he will appeal a recent decision disqualifying him from New York's general election ballot. A judge ruled yesterday that Kennedy cannot appear on the ballot because he falsely claimed a New York residence on his nominating petitions. Kennedy's campaign has condemned the decision as, quote, openly partisan. The presidential hopeful is officially on the ballot in 16 states. He's expected to appear on more by the time Election Day arrives. And a quick programming note, join us next week, starting Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern, for special convention, America Decides editions. We'll be at the Democratic National Convention. 
live in Chicago. Not sure yet if we're going to have hot dogs on set. It's being debated. Meanwhile, Governor Tim Walz is courting union members. We've been talking about working voters. He's in California. The United Auto Workers Union is also filing federal labor charges against Donald Trump and Elon Musk. A lot to discuss with the UAW President Sean Fain, who will join us next. You're streaming America Decides. So news, the United Auto Workers has filed federal labor charges against both Donald Trump and Elon Musk. The charges are tied to particular comments made during Trump's ex interview with Elon Musk yesterday. I mean, I look at what you do. You walk in and you just say, you want to quit? They go <laughs> yeah. on strike. They, I won't mention the name of the company, but they go on strike and you say, that's OK, you're all gone. You're all gone. So every one of you is gone. A senior advisor for the Trump campaign released a statement saying, in part, quote, this frivolous lawsuit is a shameless political stunt intended to erode President Trump's overwhelming support among America's workers. Elon Musk has not yet responded. Well, let's talk to Sean Fain, the president of the United Auto Workers Union. Sean, good to have you here on America Decides. We've, we've covered you a lot over the past year. Hey, Bob, thanks for having us. So tell me about the decision to do this. You're, you're either watching or informed about the comments made by Musk and Trump and you decide to file these federal labor charges, what was behind the decision to do it so quickly? Look, because this is the problem in America right now. The rich keep getting richer at the expense of the working class, and people like Donald Trump and Elon Musk, they, they sneer at labor law, but they don't care about labor law because they don't care about working class people. Uh, you know, they believe in buying off the system and, and buying off politicians and being able to have their way with people. And, you know, look, it's... It, Employers need to be held accountable in this country when they break the law. It is a federal right of workers to go on strike, and they cannot be fired for that. But, you know, people like Donald Trump and Elon Musk, they laugh about firing people because they can care less about people and about their jobs and what they do to their careers. All they care about is, is the billionaire, billionaire buddies and, and taking more wealth. And, and so this is a which side are you on election, and that's why working class people will vote for Kamala Harris and Tim Walls, because they're one of us. And Donald Trump and Elon Musk represent everything that this nation stands against. Sean, give me your assessment, the, the, the real sense of things on the ground among workers, especially in the UAW. They had a Democratic candidate who was walking the picket lines with them, and they have an ally in Vice President Harris. But Joe Biden, as president, has this 50-plus years in public life, building the relationships mm -hmm. with labor. How has the adjustment been among UAW members to the Harris campaign. I know she has been with you on stage. Uh, Walls is, the Governor Walls is speaking to labor people today in California. But what's the real sense you have about how labor is adjusting to this new dynamic and new candidate atop the ticket? I think the adjustment's amazing. Uh, look, our people, uh, they're looking forward to this. There's so much energy around this campaign. And, and the biggest reason why I think that is is because when people look at Kamala Harris, when they look at Tim Walls, they see themselves. You know, they see people that started out at McDonald's. They see a person that's been a teacher as the teaching profession has been decimated over the last few decades by the Republican Party. And so, you know, when you look at people and you see yourself, you know, they're relatable. So working class people, and especially in the UAW, are extremely excited about this campaign. We're ready to go to work to ensure they get elected because we know, you know, looking at Donald Trump, people like him, you know, no one relates to that. I mean, the man was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Daddy gave him millions to start out, and Daddy bailed him out of, you know, service to this country, and, and that's been his story in life. Uh, he serves no one but himself. Meanwhile, Kamala Harris, Tim Walls, they've spent their lives serving others, and, and that's what this election is about, is working-class people taking their lives back. Sean, last time we caught up, we were in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and you've been working to unionize uh, different automobile plants in Tennessee yeah. and elsewhere. And you look at the political map, a lot of the political map and some of these emerging battlegrounds in the Deep South and the South uh, overlap with your targets as a labor leader. Is the South a changing place politically? Is, is labor getting more of a foothold, not just in terms of union efforts, but in terms of political strength? I, look, I think, look, this all comes down. You go back to our big three campaign. Um, you know, 75 percent of Americans, union or not, supported us in that fight because the issues we're talking about, having a living wage, not a minimum wage, a 
a living wage where you can have one job and make a decent living, you know, having adequate health care, having uh, retirement security, and, and getting your time back, not having to work seven days a week, 12 hours a day, or not having to work two or three jobs just to scrape to get by paycheck to paycheck. That's what matters to American people, whether they live in the South, the North, or East or West, or wherever they live. And that's why 75% of Americans supported us. And that's why workers are understanding now the reason why they need to organize. And I believe that's what this election's about. When you look at these two candidates, you can't see a more stark contrast. You have working class people on one side with Kamala Harris and Governor Tim Walz, and you have billionaires and people that represent the billionaire interest on the other side and Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. And so it's a very clear picture for us. And I believe you're going to continue to see a shift over time with where people stand in this country. You mentioned billionaires a lot in your public remarks here in our conversation as well. But there is a push by the Trump campaign to connect with labor, especially on the issue of immigration, uh, talking about the border, talk, framing that as an economic argument for workers across the country as a reason to go with Republicans. And Republicans hosted the Teamsters at the Republican National Convention. When you are encountering a UAW member who says, and I've, I've met some of them covering the UAW, who says, look, I'm a traditional Democratic voter, but I like what Trump's saying on immigration. That's pushing my vote toward him. What do you say? Well, I say, first off, Donald Trump is all talk, and that's all he's ever been. He's no action. Uh, you look at uh, workers when Donald Trump was president in the UAW, they were left behind. Plants were closing in this country. Uh, workers at Lordstown in Ohio, their plant closed under Donald Trump. He didn't. He told those workers, don't sell your houses. And then he did nothing to help save that situation. Those workers were sent all over the country to work at other plants. And under Kamala Harris, under Joe Biden, those workers are now returning back to Lordstown because they put a battery plant in that town. So, you know, look, uh, when Trump and him talk about immigration, all the, that's how the billionaire class makes their living. They want to keep working class people divided. It's divide and conquer. It's the oldest trick in the book. They want to point a finger at the frustration for working class people in this country and why your life sucks right now. And the reason your life sucks is they want you to blame it on a black person, an LGBTQ plus person, or they want you to blame, blame it on some destitute and desperate person trying to find a better life by crossing the border. And it's a shame, but that's what these people are. They play divide and conquer and hoping that that works. But, you know, they think we're stupid. They think working class people are stupid, and we're not. We know this game. We know better than that. And at the end of the day, you know, it's what we what we bring home every day, why we work. We work to have a decent standard of living and a decent quality of life. And again, I go back to that. That's what this is all about. And Donald Trump doesn't care at all about that. All he cares about is extracting more wealth for him and his billionaire buddies while working class people continue to get left behind. Sean, final thing here. When I spoke to President Biden last week, he said he's going to work with Governor Shapiro and go, spend a lot of time in Pennsylvania. That's a battleground. We know union members are important there for a Democrat to win Pennsylvania. So put Pennsylvania to the side. Where else do you believe President Biden should be utilized to make sure labor support is stoked in the coming weeks? Um, I, look, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, battleground states we're looking at, you know, Michigan, you know, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, uh, you know, Arizona, Georgia. I mean, but, you know, ultimately, it's just this. I mean, I believe it's just talking about the successes of, of the Biden-Harris administration and what they've done to bring jobs to America, something Donald Trump didn't do. Um, you know, Donald Trump likes to talk about the auto industry and, and how he's going to save it. First off, he had an opportunity to save it, and he didn't do a damn thing. So, you know, I just believe that we got to speak truth to what's happened and, you know, talk about inflation, the real cause of inflation, corporate greed and pr consumer price gouging, not policy. And uh, so, you know, uh, and, and that's what Donald Trump represents. And I just think, uh, you know, uh, when we go to those battleground states, I think that's the winning message is that working class people, the people have to come first in this country, not the billionaire and corporate class that, that already are doing pretty damn good. Sean Fain, we appreciate your time. Sure, I'll see you on the campaign trail covering you sometime soon. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Good to see you, Bob. We are continuing to urge restraint to all parties to avoid an escalation into a wider regional conflict. On high alert, Israel and the U.S. brace for an attack from Iran and its proxies. We'll have the latest next. You're streaming America Decides. Israel is bracing for a potential attack from Iran and its proxies. 
The United States, along with the leaders of Britain, France, Germany, and Italy, are calling on Iran to, quote, stand down. Our Ramey Innocencio is in Tel Aviv, Israel. Ramey, good to see you, and thanks for all of your reporting at this time. What is the latest you're hearing about this standoff between Israel and Iran and the potential of a strike? Robert, hi there. Yeah, Iran says it has got a legal right to retaliate against Israel, and that's coming from its new president, Masoud Pazeshkin. He said that right was to act in self-defense and to respond to an aggressor. Iran does blame Israel for the assassination of Hamas's political head, Ismail Haniyeh. He was killed, as we know, in Tehran two weeks ago, right after the inauguration of the new president. Israel basically says it is ready. Last night, the spokesman for the Israel Defense Forces said that it is prepared to intercept threats in real time and that they are at a state of high readiness. Yesterday, we also spoke to former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert. He told us that Israel would launch a counterattack against Iran if they did strike and that Israel, his words, would prevail. What is the United States' posture in all of this? What are they doing behind the scenes to prevent violence from unfolding and to try to contain the situation? Right. And actually, in just the past couple hours, CBS News learned that the Biden administration greenlit $18 billion in more aircrafts and more weapons to Israel. Uh, the sale of the aircraft, specifically F-15 twin engine Eagles, had been in the works since April. But now with this region on the knife's edge of a bigger regional conflict, it's notable that Congress passed it as part of a bigger package of other weapons. As for the U.S.'s force posture, though, the uh, USS Abraham Lincoln aircraft carrier strike group uh, with several escorts and destroyers is now on the way from the Western Pacific. Uh, the USS Georgia submarine with its Tomahawk cruise missiles has been deployed here, too, on top of two new squadrons of fighter jets that arrived last week, all converging with the intent really to deter Israel and Hezbollah. But failing that, they are going to be in place to defend Israel and they could shoot down missiles and drones, any of them that are launched. Ramey Inocencio, thank you. Of course. Next, former President Trump heading to North Carolina. A preview of what he's expected to say as he gets set to deliver remarks on the economy. Your streaming America decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Former President Donald Trump set to hit the campaign trail in two battleground states this week. He will be in North Carolina tomorrow, then later in the week in Pennsylvania. His campaign announced those appearances in recent days after facing some questions from some Republicans about his schedule. People want to see him in the battleground states, we're told. Trump previously said he would travel more after the Democratic National Convention. Olivia Rinaldi, our campaign reporter covering former President Trump, joins us now from Asheville, North Carolina. Olivia, what, what do you hear from the Trump campaign about this visit to North Carolina and Pennsylvania? Is it part of a ramping up of the schedule or not? Yeah, Robert, it is part of a little bit of a ramping up of the schedule. All eyes will be on the Democratic National Convention next week, but you know Donald Trump. You've covered him. He wants to remain in the mix and in the headlines, so that's part of what this trip to Asheville is. And just to set the scene for you, what Asheville is like, I've seen a lot of Harris Wall signs so far and just the quick drive in. Uh, from the airport here. It's kind of a liberal bastion in the middle of this western North Carolina area that typically votes red. Uh, we're about an hour from the border of Tennessee. So Trump is really coming out here, even though it is a liberal uh, city and a county that has voted for a Democrat in every presidential election since 2008. Trump is really coming out here to shore up support of surrounding uh, counties. You know, it is important to note that in 2020, even though Trump won North Carolina, of all the battleground states he won, it was the state with the slimmest margin, and Vice President Kamala Harris also knows this, and so she will be visiting the state as well on Friday in Raleigh and delivering a speech on economic policy. Olivia, what else are you hearing from the Trump side? Yeah, you know, they are going to ramp up a little bit. We, this weekend, he's going to Wilkes Ferry, Pennsylvania. I believe I said that right. That's in uh, the Scranton region, which is President Biden's uh, backyard. That's where he grew up. But that's going to be his uh, eighth visit to Pennsylvania in just this cycle. That's extremely important. That state is basically for all the marbles. That's 19 electoral votes right there, the most of any battleground state that's really on the map in this cycle. So Trump will be spending a lot of time there. We're also hearing that there could be uh, a lot on the schedule for next week as a counter programming for the Democratic National Convention. But this all comes as Vice President Kamala Harris is kind of hitting a stride. You know, she's having a lot of um, 
good uh, headlines coming her way, you know, uh, positive reception from voters in a lot of battleground states for the Harris Walls ticket. Trump is very aware of this. And so it's part of an effort to really just kind of reclaim uh, his stance in this race, Robert. Olivia Rinaldi, thank you. We appreciate it. Joining us now at the table, Ashley Etienne and Kevin Sheridan. Ashley served as communications director for Vice President Kamala Harris. Kevin is a former spokesman for the Republican National Committee. Good to have you both. Ashley, it is the Democratic National Committee. Yay, uh, exciting. Having its convention, the DNC having its convention starting on Monday. What are you hearing from Vice President Harris's orbit about how they want this to play out? What's the big theme, the takeaway the Harris people want come, let's say, Thursday midnight next week? I think they want for American voters to have a greater sense of Kamala Harris as a leader and why she's the right leader for this moment. So I can anticipate what they're going to do is, is really address what's, to some degree, has been her Achilles heel. It's, it was contributed to her sort of dropping out of the Democratic primary race in 2020, and that is a lack of sort of a sense from the American people of who she is as, as a leader and why it is that, again, she's the right leader for this moment. So I think they're going to do a lot of storytelling about her. They're going to peel back a lot of the layers, really start from her, you know, do more biography, start from her beginnings, and explain, again, what is her ethos. You know, I know her to be the type of leader that sees people, because she grew up, you know, in a household with a single mom in a multicultural, multi-ethnic community with people up and down the economic scale. So she has a keen sense of what people are going through and how they're um, trying to overcome their, their circumstances and their hopes and dreams. So I think they're going to get into that. They're going to tell the story of Kamala Harris. So it's going to be interesting to see how they actually do that. Her successes and, again, why she's the right leader for this moment. How are Republicans going to deal with the story of Vice President Harris being presented over the course of four days in Chicago? And she's, for now, such a, a fresh presence on the American political scene in the sense that so many voters have not fully engaged with her, her record, her persona for three and a half years. Most vice presidents, as we all know, out of the headlines. She's now in every headline, politically speaking. So how, how does that affect Republicans as they look at this convention? Well, which Kamala are we going to get? Um, she ran on one platform in 2020. She's obviously modified a lot of those positions this time. Uh, Republicans have had a ch an opportunity in the last few weeks to define her. Uh, I don't know that they have done that yet. And <laughs> the answer's no. Uh, yeah. So they're going to have to continue to do that. The Trump super PAC is uh, coming out with a $100 million ad buy. Uh, let's see how those ads look and uh, what message they're going to pick to define her, because there's a lot of ways you could define her. A quick uh, follow up on that. Where do you believe Republicans are going to shine that light? Is it on the border? Is it on the economy? Is it on another issue, cultural issues, social issues? You, you are a Republican strategist, a veteran one. You talk to a lot of Republican strategists. When they conclude on where to spend, where to focus the advertising, the message, where do you believe they land? Obviously the border, um, her experience, uh, her lack of a proven track record. Uh, so I don't know what their internal testing has shown in the last three weeks. Uh, we're now three weeks into it and uh, they've tried out a lot of lines. Uh, we'll see which one they think is going to stick, at least from the super PAC side. Uh, Donald Trump needs to lock in though and make that case. Uh, the policy case against her uh, relentlessly and stay off of the other issues that he's been, you know, going off on uh, pretty regularly. And that, that's been his Achilles heel right so now. So let's say, let's, we'll get to the personal attacks in a minute, but the, uh, let's say the Republicans do focus on the border sure. as their policy attack. Yeah. We've seen from her advertising so far, she's casting her, her record as one of a prosecutor from a border state, California. We've seen it in at least an ad or two, but what's the forceful response, if any, you expect from the Harris side when that barrage of tens of maybe even $100 million of advertising comes down on Vice President Harris this fall? Well, Bob, what I've been really struck by is, you know, the vice president's rally in, in Atlanta, for example. When she came on the stage, she talked about the fact that I know Donald Trump, I know his type, but immediately pivot to the border and then immediately pivot to, to inflation and the economy. I mean, the fact that she's aggressively leaning into these issues, you know, Democrats typically shy away from these issues, which is why we have a vulnerability on them. But the fact that she's leaning in and not 
again, walking away from these issues, I find very intriguing, very impressive, and really the right approach. She's got a great story there. Absent telling that story, it's being filled by Republican misinformation. The reality is that the Republicans walked away, you know this, from a bipartisan deal. It was a conservative's wish list. Uh, the Biden-Harris uh, administration had to take a action, um, pass an executive order, border crossings down 40 percent. When she was doing, uh, focusing on root causes, she raised five to ten billion dollars from public-private partnerships, bringing folks to the table with equities from Japan to uh, private co corporations to invest in addressing those root causes, which has contributed to border crossings going down. So she's doing the right tactic, which is lean into your issue, lean into the issue, tell your story. If you don't tell the story, Republicans are going to tell it for you. And when, and now we're seeing that this has become less of a, a sort of lightning rod for Democrats. This has become less of an effective. A messaging tool for Republicans because she's not shying away. She's actually leaning in. So I, I anticipate that she's going to continue leaning in. Can I just add one thing? I think what she should start to do, and hopefully she'll do this at the conventions, is broaden out how she talks about herself as a prosecutor. Not just prosecuting criminals like Donald Trump, but prosecuting uh, big banks that are taking advantage of homeowners and greedy insurance companies. Start to frame her as the people's prosecutor, not just one that's going to go after criminals, but, but one who has a proven track record of taking on big business um, uh, private corporations that take advantage of the American people and the working class, I think she needs to expand her frame to become the people's prosecutor. Just real quick on the border. They don't have a messaging problem on the border. They have a policy problem on the border. They've been in charge. They are currently in charge. And, and illegals are still flowing into the United States. So some States. of the numbers have gone down. Yeah, they're down 40%. Relatively speaking, that's like saying inflation is down, but, but it's over time, it's 15 million people. But here's people. the reality. The issue with the border they didn't don't start an with the, the issue with the border didn't start with Donald Trump. This is a perpetual problem for the United States. It's we need the a level we from need to level four years to the we need a level set are, with are the drastic. American people. Where we are right now, the numbers of border crossings are, are less than where they were with Donald but Trump. But if she when wants he was to run on tough on the border, she could do something right now. Her boss Joe and, Biden can and, do it, it right now. It has now. been done. That's why border crossings are down 40 percent, less than where they were with Donald Trump. So, I mean, so the fact well, that— We, we have to wrap it here. Sure. But we can come back. No. <laughs> we can always have a, a running conversation. See you in Chicago. I will see you all in Chicago. It will be fun. And maybe we can all broker America's immigration debate over a, a hot dog <laughs> full of all the Chicago specialties. Kevin Sheridan, Ashley Etienne, appreciate you stopping Thank you, by. Uh, we'll have this conversation again, I'm sure, sometime soon. New York, former New York Congressman George Santos was in court today where a judge rejected his request to have potential jurors in his upcoming trial questioned about their opinions of him. Jury selection was one of several pretrial disputes his lawyers and federal prosecutors sparred over. The trial, which was scheduled to begin on September 9th, will now get underway September 16th. The judge is allowing a Santos request that jurors have their identities kept secret from the public. Santos, as you recall, is facing 23 charges, including money laundering, and he has pleaded not guilty. You vote, and election officials, they certify. But contesting the election is now once again at the fore of our presidential campaign. A new report is raising red flags about what's happening across the country. We'll find out more next on America Decides. With less than three months to go until Election Day, a watchdog group is warning of threats to the certification of the 2024 election. Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, also known as CRU, has published a new report identifying 35 county officials who have previously refused to certify election results and may be in a position to do so again. Six of the eight states focused on, on this in this report are battleground states. Noah Bookbinder is the president of the group behind this report and joins us now at the table. Noah, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, when I sat down with President Biden, he said he's not sure there's going to be a peaceful transfer of power. And he said he has fears if Trump wins, but if Trump loses, uh, Trump, he, in his view, would continue to contest the election as he did in 2020, refuse to concede even to this day, the 2020 election. That's at a very macro level. At a micro level, what are you finding in your research about Trump allies across the country who are in powerful election positions. Yeah, we're finding uh, more than 30 election officials, many of them in key states, who have 
refused to certify elections in a lot of cases in pretty low profile elections in 2022, even 2023, uh, in primaries this year, uh, in what seems to be kind of a dress rehearsal for this fall um, when the stakes will be a lot higher, when Donald Trump, who is the, the person who has kind of spread this idea of uh, that elections can't be trusted and, and need to be challenged, uh, is going to be on the ballot. And so I think we have every reason to think that um, many, if not all of these folks, and maybe some others, uh, will be uh, refusing to certify elections in the fall, which is contrary to law. Uh, but the good news is there, there are things that states can do about that and that some states are already doing. Help us understand for people who don't pay attention to this every day, who certifies elections in some of these states? So if you're calling out election officials for being, uh, having a precedent or a, a history of not certifying elections or being wary of certifying election, does that, ma why does that matter? Because in some states you're, you're looking at, doesn't the legislature ultimately decide? So where does an election official really raise a red flag to you as having significant power over whether the electoral college count in that state's going to be affirmed or not? Yeah, so first of all, in every state, there are legitimate ways to contest uh, election results. If there are questions about fraud or questions about the count, uh, in some cases you can go to court, you can go to election boards. Um, county certification is not one of those. So what happens is, you know, election, um, ballots are counted. Uh, these local jurisdictions, in many cases counties, uh, certify that. That's essentially a ministerial function. It's kind of doing the addition and passing it on. Then the state certifies. Then that goes to the Electoral College. The problem is that if you have counties refusing to certify and that can't be worked out within a couple of days, then you have uh, the state, which needs to certify uh, its election totals in a presidential election. And if they don't have final numbers from all the counties, it's not entirely clear what states will do. That can take some time. Then you get to the, the point of, of the Electoral College and even of congressional certification. And if you don't have final numbers from those earlier stages, it can really uh, have a cascading effect that can call the whole election into question. And, and that's why these things that need to be worked out and worked out quickly. Where would ground zero be, in, in your view, of where there could be a problem post-November 2020? I mean, I think ground zero is in Georgia, um, because uh, what you have in a lot of these states is uh, county officials who, in some cases, have questioned elections, have refused to certify them. And in most cases, state officials have acted quickly and decisively to, uh, to reverse that, to take legal action. In Georgia, you have a state election board that, as of now, is working to actually empower counties to refuse to certify or to delay certifying, which is the opposite of what's happening in, in almost every other one of these states. Um, and that is really troubling and, and something that, that I think will uh, require a lot of attention, maybe some legal action between now and the election. And is there anyone in the state, real quickly, who you are keeping an eye on that we should pay attention to, in your view? Um, I mean, there is a, um, a an election official in Fulton County, Georgia, who has actually filed suit asking the court to essentially authorize uh, her to refuse to certify uh, elections. And, and that's definitely uh, a, a red flag and something to keep a close eye on. And we'll keep a close eye on all of this. Noah Bookbinder, thank you for being here at America Decides. We appreciate it. That does it for today. We will be back with another edition of America Decides tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. The Daily Report with John Dickerson starts right now.